morning at Heathrow Airport. Everyone got rid of their drinks, yeah, water. I'm Miriam Francois Gerard. I'm a journalist and a British Muslim. Is it possible to have an aisle seat? I'm flying out to Bosnia on the 20th anniversary of the worst atrocity in Europe since the Second World War. I'm going to the place where in 1995, thousands of Muslim men and boys were massacred. This is a genocide that happened to Europe's oldest Muslim community, and there is a responsibility to remember this injustice. I'm travelling with a group of British students, all born in the same year as the massacre. I want to know what it means for young people today. So I'm 19 years old, I'm Muslim, so in 1995, what would have been my fate? It's going to be an emotional trip. I promise I'll do everything I can to help this never, ever happen again. And at times, it will be disturbing. A life full of expectation, just gone. I realise many people in Britain know little about this genocide. But with so much turmoil in the world today, I think that's a mistake. The story of what happened really does hold relevance. Shouldn't we really be trying to learn some lessons from what happened there? This is the story of Srebrenica, a story we all need to know. The students I'm travelling with are all 19 or 20 and come from different backgrounds. Yeah, you can see shelling damage up there. Yeah. For most, the stories we'll be hearing are distant history. But for Julie, it's a bit more personal. I've been called the Bosnia baby since I was little. My parents were both in Bosnia. They met in Bosnia. Julie's dad is Colonel Bob Stewart, who was United Nations commander of the British forces in Bosnia. I just had the HVO telling me no cameras. I told him to get stuff. I've come on this trip to learn more about what my parents have done, what they could have done better, well, not just them, but the whole country. On this trip, we'll be meeting people whose lives were changed by the war. First, our guide, Rashad Tabonia, who explains how the conflict began. The map that you can see here was the map that we used to give to the tourists coming to this country in 1984 when we hosted the Olympics. Bosnia was once part of Yugoslavia, home to Orthodox Christian Serbs, Catholic Croats and Muslim Bosniaks. But by 1992, Yugoslavia had fallen apart and Bosnia became independent. Most Bosnian Serbs rejected independence and fought instead for a state that would unite all Serbs. Violence erupted across nationalist, ethnic and religious divides. The bombardment of the medieval city of Sarajevo has prompted the government to declare a state of emergency. Serb forces besieged the capital, Sarajevo. In April 1992, I was 19. I was at your age. I was wearing a T-shirt, listening to Ramon's U2 clash. Within a week, all that was gone. All of a sudden, I found myself being a volunteer, defending its own country. Thousands, who is like I was, just like London today, Sarajevo had long been a melting pot. What you had, guys, is really, really narrow. 19-year-old medical student Abdul is shocked to hear how quickly this cosmopolitan community disintegrated. The way Russia is explaining it, they lived a life similar to ours. Yeah. And then overnight it became something totally different. If I'm honest, all throughout secondary school, I, I never heard of Bosnia. And I find it peculiar that it happened in mainland Europe and it's quite recent, but you find that we don't, we don't actually hear about it. You sometimes think that when Muslim people die, it's not as a, you don't learn about it as much. Rashad shows us news footage of the city under siege. 
Julie's father was in Sarajevo when the Holiday Inn famously came under attack. Your father was in the building at that time, wasn't he? My dad stayed on the other side of the Holiday Inn so he could be safer because they were shooting on only one side, I think. There's footage of it like going completely up in flames. And it's just and on top of this, now you add starvation, no electricity, no water, nothing. Rashad brings to life what happened here. From one day to the next, his life was thrown in disarray. He ends up on the front line having to defend the multicultural values of his city. And I think that really rung true for so many of these young people that, you know, actually a lot of what we take for granted is quite fragile. We've got a long journey ahead now. We're off to Srebrenica itself. Yeah, you have Evan Ferris. What is your view on Beyonce? This trip is organised by a charity called Remembering Srebrenica. You guys coming back? Yeah, we're coming all the way back. Its founder, Dr. Wakar Azmi, remembers watching footage of Bosnia on the news. Really had a deep impact because I wondered whether it could happen to me, you know, if I, in, in Britain, being a Muslim, the racism that I face and I grew up with. I left academia and devoted my whole life to fighting racism. 19-year-old English student Izzy is from Shropshire. She's hearing about what happened here for the first time. I feel guilty that I don't know a lot, but I think it's really important because at the moment, I've got this kind of negative view about what's happening in the world, all this kind of intolerance within countries, communities, and different kind of beliefs. And I'm, I'm, I'm scared for the, for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please, just for a second? We're now literally 10 minutes away from Srebrenica. Srebrenica is the main destination for all these trips. It is actually a border town. It is, it is a front line between Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. We'll spend the night here before visiting the scene of the genocide. Tomorrow the group will be confronted with really the culmination of the conflict that happened here. And I think it's really one thing to hear or read about mass killings, but it really is quite another to come face to face with the sheer brutality that happened here. Um, so I expect it to be quite a shock to the system. Next morning, we head to the old UN headquarters. The United Nations had declared a safe area around Srebrenica and banned any attack. But the Bosnian Serb army ignored this and on July the 11th, 1995, General Radko Mladic led a major offensive. Thousands of Bosnian Muslim refugees turned to the UN's Dutch peacekeepers for protection. The soldiers were stationed in this old factory north of the town. Abdul's read about the crowds who gathered here seeking refuge. I know a bit about this place like there. There's 5,000 people inside the base. And people that couldn't get in were just standing outside. As the Bosnian Serb army advanced, one of those fleeing the town was Hassan Hasanovic. So this used to be the headquarters of the Dutch UN battalion. People were desperate. At least uh, 40,000 40, people in, in Srebrenica town, uh, they, they were so scared. Uh, they fled, the, most of them fled, to this Dutch base here, hoping that they will be protected by Dutch soldiers here. As for Hassan, he joined a huge column of men who decided to try and walk 63 miles to a region under Bosnian Muslim control. More than 12,000 of men uh, tried to escape through the woods. I was there with my twin brother and father. But unfortunately, just, uh, I would say, 20 kilometers from here, the column 
was ambushed, attacked by the Bosnian Serb army. At least 1,000 of men and boys was either killed or wounded. Those who survived the ambush kept going, but it became a death march. Thousands more would be captured and killed. How old were you when you started walking through the forest? So I was 19. 19 years old. Yeah, 19. My father and my twin brother, uh, I, I lost the sight of them just like five kilometers from here. And I hope that, I was hoping that they would come as well, you know, as survivors. It was almost 10 years before Hassan found out what had happened to his family. His father and brother had been killed and their bodies dumped in mass graves. In 2003, I buried my father. In 2005, I buried my twin brother, which was the most difficult day in my life. Hassan goes on to tell us what happened to the unarmed refugees, hoping to find protection with the UN. Bosnian Serb forces began to separate women and children from the men and teenage boys. The peacekeepers didn't stop them. The buses came, then the refugees outside of the, of the base were, were ordered by the Bosnian Serb army to board, to board on those buses and trucks. The Bosnian Serb army only let women and children and a really small number of very old men to go to get on the buses. They kept separating boys as old as 13, 14 from their mothers. The women were bussed away to neighboring Bosnian Muslim territory. Many suffered terrible abuse. Over the next few days, Bosnian Serb soldiers dealt with the men. All those separated people were taken later by the Bosnian Serb army to execution sites and they were killed. All in all, around 8,000 men and boys were executed. Have you ever met any of the Dutch peacekeepers? Yes, I have. And do they feel, do they feel regret of letting those people out? I can say that Dutch soldiers were also very, very much scared. You know, they were young and uh, they also feared for their lives. And uh, they were just following the orders from their superiors. So now you're watching a documentary. So it covers from the fall of Srebrenica until a few days afterwards. It's a very difficult watch. I just couldn't watch it, I just had to leave. They're like, they were all similar ages as well, as well. So you can think about like you and your friend or your brother and you're all together in a van and you know that you're about to die. Like at one meal, I literally thought I was going to be sick. And it was awful. I just wasn't... I know you got to see those things, but I wasn't expecting to see that. Hmm. It's quite chilling, actually. I think it's, like, made my stomach just a bit weird. I just sort of, like, want to go back home and, like, tell my family just how much I love them, really, yeah. Because what happened here isn't really widely known, um, I do think it is helpful for people to realise just how systematic the killings were. I do think those images are likely to, to stay with you and if something positive can come from learning about that, then you know, you've got to hope that it was, it was worth it. The actions of the UN at Srebrenica come as a shock to Julie. At the UN, they did make a difference, they did try. Like, it's not like they completely bailed out, but... In a way, they were so cowardly that you but just suppose don't expect that, of... because you hear from the UN, the UN always doing good, you never know oh. anything bad. We've now got the chance to meet some of the women who lost their husbands and sons. They're known as the mothers of Srebrenica. <laughs> On 11th of July 1995, within one day, I've lost, lost 23 family members. As they, 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 quite often they say, 
we, we died long time ago, but we are just waiting for our turn to be buried. I buried my youngest son. His last words were, Mom, don't worry, everything is going to be okay. Trust me, trust me, I have no strength to talk about it, because my soul is in pain. Hearing the mother's stories overwhelms everyone. I, I promise, I promise I will do everything I can to help this never ever happen again. Um, I'm from the Congo, my parents are from the Congo, so we know a lot about war Congo. and suffering and what's going on, so I definitely sympathise with what's happened in Trebunisa. Your kindness reminds me of my grandmother. <laughs> Okay, so we'll just take a walk now to the, the, the graves, the, the cemetery, um, and pay our respects. The cemetery is an internationally recognized memorial center for the victims of the Srebrenica genocide. There's something about seeing so many rows of names. The same name. Of the same name. They're all family. It's just weird just thinking how some of them were so young. 1974, that would be 21 years old, just a life full of expectation, just gone. Going from one really emotional experience here to another very emotional experience, but possibly in a quite a different way. We're off now to meet with the Serb official. Uh, remembering Srebrenica don't usually incorporate this into what they do, but I wanted to hear from a Serb official what their view of the events were, and the group are really keen to hear his side of the events. I suspect it'll be quite a tense meeting. The Srebrenica massacre galvanised the international community into action. A peace deal followed, which accepted a new Bosnian Serb region within Bosnia itself. Today, Srebrenica is in that Republic of Srpska. The Serb president of the Municipal Assembly has agreed to talk to us. But the group is still raw from hearing the testimony of the Muslim survivors. And so civil greetings don't come easily for everyone. Uh, Mr. Manovanovic, I want to take you back to 1995 and ask you how the tragedy that unfolded here happened. How did neighbours end up killing neighbours? Maybe your first question should have been what happened here in Srebrenica from 1992 until 1995. Many people were killed during this war. Serbs and Bosniaks. On the 15th of May 1992, for example, this was the village where I was born. Four civilian victims were burned alive in a house. And there are plenty of examples like that of things that happened to the Serb people. There's been widespread international acceptance that what happened in Trepanica was a genocide. Do you agree with that? As a Serb and a member of the Serb people, I cannot and will not agree with the classification of the Hague Tribunal that the whole nation should be held responsible for some crimes that were committed by individuals. So I'm 19 years old, I'm Muslim, so in 1995, what would have been my fate? Would I be here today? I think your question is very provocative because there were people who were about your age who survived in Srebrenica. I, I understand people survived, but what about those who did it? What happened to them? Because I could have been one of them. Those who committed crimes against people should be held responsible. The official urges me to take the group to a memorial for Serbs who died in the conflict. But I want to know whether he's visited the cemetery for the many thousands of Muslim dead. 
No. You've not been to the memorial? No. So no. no. Okay. Okay, so what you're actually doing by not going to the memorial is showing the Bosnian Muslims I actually don't care about the people that have died. Me personally, I might be wrong in not doing it, but I'm telling you there were Serbs before me that have done it. Yeah. As the meeting ends, Thank Abdul can't much. hide his frustration. Thanks for having us. Because you know lying takes energy up, so you get tired. It's sickening, I think. So he managed to redirect every question. He didn't answer yet. The group is taken aback that the official won't acknowledge that what happened in Srebrenica should be termed a genocide. I know that we all had quite different reactions, actually, and some of them came out most obviously um, <laughs> as, we, as we were leaving, maybe. Um, how did you feel in there? I mean, what was your...? It was nothing that I didn't expect. He, he dodged the questions, but he done it intellectually, so he always brought it back down to the Serbians that died. I don't think he was expecting the questions we had. And your question. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was just asking you about my fate. I mean, <laughs> Do you think it was a provocative question? No, because the, 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 I just wanted to say my fate would, would be death, because yeah. that is the truth. If I said to you that, you know, the Bosnian issue for a lot of Muslims, a lot of British Muslims, it's still a very raw issue. Do you understand why it might be? There's just been so many hate crimes towards innocent Muslims, you know, just because of everything that's going on with ISIS. Muslim fanaticism is always about oh, ISIS have just recently beheaded someone. If your only knowledge of Islam is coming from ISIS. that blanket coverage of the media, then it's very easy to have a lot of discriminatory views. Your, like, nationality or your... It shouldn't define you, you know? I'm Jewish, but I'm also Hannah from Cardiff, you know? You know, judge me on my action. If I offend you, hate me for it. But don't hate me just because I'm Jewish. And I can say the same thing for me as well as a young black person growing up in London. It should be like a shared, common, collective cause rather than just an individual, oh, Islamic issue, oh, a racial issue. Because it all stems from one aspect, and that is intolerance. Mm -hmm. Today, we've heard from both sides of Srebrenica's scarred community. It's been an unsettling experience. It's the end of a really long day here. Um, and even though a truce ended the hostilities here 20 years ago, there's still a real sense that things are quite tense. I can definitely say that I feel pretty uncomfortable in Srebrenica 20 years on. almost 7,000 victims from Srebrenica using DNA technology. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dragana, uh, who's a forensic anthropologist. Basically, from um, every body part or, or every body, we have to take uh, one DNA sample. You can see there's a small window here. So it's a very small segment of the bone sample that's necessary for DNA testing. And we want to be respectful of the mortal remains also. So when we receive DNA uh, report, uh, family can decide whether they want to bury it. It's usually we discourage them to come because it is very stressful for them to see it. Jonas has assumed that Dragana Vucetic, the scientist dedicated to conducting this painstaking work, is a Bosnian Muslim. 
How does it make you feel, like, as a person working for this organisation, that there are people in your country that would like to de deny that a genocide took place? How do you know where I'm from? <laughs> oh, that's a good question, actually. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I'm, 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 no, I'm from Serbia. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> we know yeah. who killed those people, but we can't talk about uh, all people from Serbia or from Bosnia and Serbia that they are guilty, and we don't have to, to feel like that, to feel bad. Well, sorry about I'm not that. guilty yeah. about yeah, exactly. <laughs> other people what they what they did, you know. Yeah. And Abdul is still thinking about his encounter with the Bosnian Serb official. Yesterday we met this Milos guy, the in charge of Srebrenica, and he said that there were Serbian mass graves. Do you have any evidence that there were mass graves of Serbians found? There, around the former Yugoslavia, there are graves of all ethnic re religious groups, yes. Srebrenica is unique. Uh, it's the only recognized genocide on European soil. That's a given. Uh, but other crimes, many crimes, took place across ethnic religious lines in this country. Um, and I think there's a huge amount of, of feeling of finger pointing. They're responsible. So what you're seeing is an attempt to deal with the hate and anger that provides healing in the longer term. For the group, today has shown how easily stereotypes can lead to discrimination. Jonas's awkward moment with the Serbian forensic scientist has given him new perspective. We can't think of it as just Serbians being the antagonists of the story because it is a very dangerous view to have because that's essentially the breeding ground of hatred and intolerance, having that us versus them mentality, having an antagonist, some group to hate. The wider Serbian people haven't committed any crimes and probably uh, believe that what happened and condemn it. But the fact that this perpetrator is still walking around, it just doesn't help the reconciliation process. For the trip's organiser, Dr Azmi, the real test comes when the young people go home. In return for their place on the trip, they must all pledge to take one specific action. Whether giving a talk or raising funds, the aim is to tackle racism and intolerance back home in Britain. What we have found is that every single person who has come here, of course they feel upset, but they uh, get inspiration from that and they absolutely want to go back and uh, make a difference in the local communities. Meeting the people, experiencing it ourselves, I don't know if life is going to be the same afterwards. <laughs> We're going to go out and learn more about the world, like learn more about politics, about why these things are happening. Often it's easier to point the finger, have something to blame and look for retribution. You need to, you need to relate this to like what's happening now because it could quite easily happen again. And that's what's, quite, that's what's quite scary. For me, there's a sense in Britain that we in Western Europe are somehow beyond these conflicts, that it could never happen to us. But the truth is that's exactly what the Bosnians were saying in the 1990s. So maybe one of the lessons of Srebrenica is that actually fear and suspicion of one another takes hold most easily when we think we're immune to it. There are people that you may not like, but that doesn't represent society as a whole. Love prevails hate, and that's, I think that's such a real strong message to take back home.